Thank you to all of you for being here early in the morning. So are you ready to learn the deep truths behind real programming languages? So, and we'll have some fun on the way. I, I actually uh, got the name of the conference wrong. I apologize for that. On the slide, you can see I turned it from um, a verb into a noun. But um, let's have some joy anyway. But I want to be as happy as that octopus. So propositions as types is about this really cool idea. Right? That's why I talk about real programming languages. Right? So this cool idea, which was discovered in the 1930s, is that if you formalize the core ideas behind logic, and you formalize the cool ideas behind programming languages, and I have two specific formalizations in mind. So on the one hand, we have Gensen's system of natural deduction, which formalizes what logic is. And on the other hand, we have Church's simply typed lambda calculus, which formalizes a programming language. And right, this is the right way to do things, right? What is the right time to formalize the notion of programming languages? Just a few years before the computer is invented, right? That's the right time to do it. Okay, so that's what happened. And then, so these were both formalized in the 1930s. And you wait a bit, because that's what you do with real things. It doesn't happen overnight. But all you need to do is wait 50 years, and somebody will have a new idea. And indeed, you wait 50 years, and these two things that were both discovered in the 1930s, in 1980, William Howard publishes a paper saying, oh, look, they are exactly the same thing. Right? And that gives you a sense that you've not invented something, you've discovered something. So lambda calculus, the core of every functional language in existence, is discovered, not invented. Right? And we know this because Gerhard Gensen and Alonzo Church both came up with the same idea, but it took about 40 years before people recognized, oh, these are the same idea. And that took another 10 years for Howard to get around to publishing it. OK? But that's the core of what I want to talk about. So that's what the talk at Strange Loop was about. But I'm not going to give you that talk. You can go see it online if you like, or you can read about it in communications of the ACM. Uh, and by the way, I think William accidentally mispronounced it. It's not propositions and types. It's propositions as types. Right? They're the same thing, propositions of logic and types in a programming language. Uh, and one of the questions afterwards is, does this connect to anything else? And that reminded me to say, oh yes, there are deep connections to category theory. So that's what I thought I would talk about today, is the additional connections to category theory. And this is, um, category, th Category theory is basically very simple. Here's the key idea behind category theory. You take some concept that some people know really well, and you abstract it to the level where it becomes impossible to understand. <laughs> That's what category theory is about. Things that you know well made difficult. So what I'm going to do is give the simplest introduction to category theory that I possibly can. I figure I'll make it so simple, I'm, I'm actually worried that I might not use up my half hour, but I bet I will. Ooh, speaking of which, is there a clock anywhere so I can make sure that I'm not late? No, How, right, how many minutes have I got left? 25, okay. Give, give me a hand signal when I've got five minutes left. And then that gives another 10 minutes for questions afterwards. Right, perfect, okay. So I'm worried that I might have made it too simple, but I bet not. But this is making it as simple as possible. I'll explain that as we go along. So are you ready to learn about object-oriented programming? Right, because that's what category theory is, because we've got objects. Except object in category theory is the name of a type. And then, um, what do you do? What, what are types good for? Types describe 
functions, right? Your function will have an argument of a given type and return a result of a given type. You can all think of functions like that. So w w all you do in category theory is instead of calling a type a type, you call it an object. And instead of calling a function a function, you call it an arrow. And it turns out there are many instances of this. So you can think of a programming language with types and functions. Or you can think of set theory. So your objects are going to be sets. And then your arrows can be functions between the sets. Or they could also be relations between the sets. Um, or you can do domain theory. And then your objects are domains. And your arrows are, again, functions between the domains. Or you can do abstract algebra. And your objects are things like groups. And then your arrows are things like morphisms between groups, which just means morphism is a fancy name for function. It means a function that preserves some structure. So a group is something that has a binary operator and a unit. And it just means that the function takes the unit of one into the unit of the other. And um, if you've got two values and you combine them with the um, operator of the first group, and then apply the function, you could instead apply the function to both arguments and then apply the operator of the second group, because now you're in the second group, and that gives you the same result. See, your head's hurting already, isn't it? And what can we do with functions? So we'll, we'll just talk about two simple things we can do with functions. You can, can you see the little thingy that I'm pointing to ID with there? Yep, good. So you've got the identity function on object A, and what does that? That's the function from A to A. Guess what that function does? Nothing, right. Given an argument, it returns the exact same argument without changing it. Uh, and the other thing you can do with functions is compose them. So if I've got a function from A to B, called F, and another function from B to C, called G, I can compose them. And that's a function um, called F semicolon G, sometimes written g dot f, uh, because people like to reverse things to confuse everybody. Right? And that, of course, would be a function from A to C. So that's all category theory is about, just enough types to know when you can compose two functions. So the answer is you can compose them if the Target of one is the source of the other. The range of one is the domain of the other. So that means f goes from a to b, and g starts at b and goes to c. So that composition is well-defined. Oops, don't want to be there yet. Uh, and then you get some laws. Right? The law says the identity followed by f is the same as f followed by the identity. Oops, see, I've already got an error in here. Is the same as f. But, right, you can tell these slides are old school. Right, I actually I wrote them out by hand with these pens. Um, and writing things out by hand, right, I had to do each one of these slides about three times before I got all the really stupid errors out. But um, there's still some errors left, so you, you can point them out. Right? If you ever have a question, just raise your hand and ask a question. Are there any questions yet? Not yet. OK, don't be shy with questions. But anyhow, identity followed by f is the same as f followed by identity, which is also the same, of course, as just f. And then if you compose three things, it doesn't matter what order you compose them in. And that has a fancy name that's called associativity. Okay. So good. I see at least a couple of people nodding. So is, is your head starting to hurt? Are you bored because this is all so simple? Not quite. Okay. So now we get the, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the three most important structures in programming languages and show you how those arise in category theory. And of course, because there's this correspondence between programming and logic, it turns out the three most important structures in programming languages are also the three most important constructors in logic. So the first is the product. So um, what's a product? So given an object A and an object B, we form the product A times B. So if these are sets, this would be Cartesian product. How many people are familiar with that? 
quite a few of you. And if it's a, um, a programming language, what data structure are we talking about here? The tuple, right, or the record. So this is, in, in particular, a special case of the tuple record, one with two fields, right? And the first field has a value of type A, and the second field has a value of type B. So how are we going to characterize what it means for something to be a product? Well, you better be able to extract the fields from the object, right? So you've got a function first, which given an AB pair, returns the A component. And you have a function second, which given an AB pair, returns the B component. That's boring, right? You, you all follow that. Not if you follow that. You're not nodding. You're still not nodding. Ask a question. Right? People lie about this. OK, I'm going to slowly sweep my gaze through the room. And if you're bored so far, if you understand what a product is, just nod your head, OK? He's asleep. <laughs> Everybody back here is catatonic. Okay, yeah, now even people in the back row are nodding. Good. OK, so, so the party last night wasn't so good that you can't understand products. OK, now, but there's more. OK, what, what else do we need to know? Well, what we need to know is, given some other thing C, some other type C, I might have a function C from C to A called F, and a function from C to B called G. And then what can I do with that? Well, given a C, if I apply F, I'll get an A, and if I apply G, I get a B, and then I can build a pair from that A and that B. So this function is called funny angle bracket, F comma G, close funny angle bracket. Right? And that just means build an AB pair from a C. How do you do that? Apply F to C to get your A component, and apply G to C to get your B component. So that's important, right? First and second are how you take a pair apart, and then this construct is how you build a pair. And then we've got a property. Right? indicated by the diagram. What does the diagram tell us? It says, if you build a pair using F and G, and you extract first the first component, well, that gets you from a C to an A. But it does, of course, just the same thing as using F. Right? They're identical. And similarly, if um, we go from C via F, G to an A, B, and then we use second. That gets us to a B, but that's just the same as using G. So you can see there are two paths from C to A, one that says do F, G, and then do first, and one that says do F. And those are both the same. In fact, I wrote this down. It's written down here. And the other path says do F, G, and then do second, and that's the same as G. Now, immediately, we already know some stuff about our programming language, right? Because this tells us F and G better not have side effects that, interfe that um, are important. Because if they did, right, F, G would do both sets of side effects. But F just does one, and G just does one. So if they're going to be exactly the same, you better not have side effects. So this is an argument against having side effects, is it gives you nice, simple laws. So FG followed by first is F, FG followed by second is G. And then this line is dotted. And what the dotted means is, if a line, if a function makes this, oh, right, more terminology. This is called a commuting diagram. And all that means is what I just told you, which is if there are two different pathways through the diagram from one place to another that involve applying different functions, they must be equal. Right? So here's one path, and here's the other path, and they're the same, which is given by this equation. And similarly here. Now let's have got an H, an arbitrary H. And all we know is that H followed by first is F, and G followed by h is second, which is what I've written down right here, then what we can conclude is h is the same as fg. That is, there's only one arrow 
from C to AB that makes this diagram commute. Okay, so it, there's a unique, FG is unique, and we indicate that by writing a dotted line here. And that has a fancy name, that's called a universal property. Okay? So pairs, so what have we got? You can take pairs apart using first and second, you can build them using FG, those operations are inverse to each other, and FG is the unique thing that makes this work. Pretty easy. Is being unique important? Yeah, there are all sorts of things that you can work out from that that are really useful. Like you can prove things, like if I start at a D and go from D to C and then do FG, it, um, what would that be? Well, that would be some other function, let's call it um, EFGHI, I, going from D to C. We do it first, let's call it E. E going from D to C and E followed by FG in brackets is the same as in brackets E followed by F and E followed by G. Oh, I really need to be able to write that down. Too bad. You've all visualized that clearly in your head, right? But you can prove that from it. I'll show you another thing you can prove, which is oh, oops, also important. Um, we can pick F and G to be anything we want, right? So here's the standard categorical trick. Pick them to be the simplest thing you can think of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, and we pick C to be anything we want too. Okay? So what's the stupid simplest thing I could do here? Let's pick C to be the same as A times B. Now I need something that goes from A times B to A. What's that? Oh wait, first does that. So I'll pick F to be first. And I'll pick G to be second. Okay? And then I get, whoop. This diagram. And we know it commutes, right? So what does that tell us? It says if we do A times B, and then first, second, followed by first, that's the same as just doing first. And A, B, followed by first, second, and then do second, that's just the same as doing second. So what, what, what is first, second going to be? Well, ah, wait, if I do identity, right? If I do nothing to go from A times B to A times B, and then do first, ah, uh, that's the same as doing first and similarly for second. So we know that ID makes the diagram commute, and we know by definition that the first-second pair makes the diagram commute. So that tells us first-second must be the same as ID. Does that make sense? Let's see. I've got this thingy, a pair, and I'm going to build a new pair. And the way I'm going to build a new pair is from A, B, I'm going to take the first component and let that be the first component of the new pair. And from A, B, I'm going to take the second component and let that be the second component of the new pair. Oh, that doesn't do very much, does it? Okay. That's it. All right? You now thoroughly understand category theory. Okay? Yay! Give yourselves a round of applause. Okay, so let's turn that into a programming language, right? So I'm going to let L, M, and N range over terms. And in a programming language, you have some free variables bound in gamma. And using the free variables, we're going to build a term M of type A. How many people have seen something like this before for programming languages and types? Not many of you. Okay, so the rest of you should now consider yourselves initiated. Right? This is the way that you write down a type system. Right? All you guys that have been using English or Dutch or whatever language you like to write down your description of your type language, guess what? There's a better way. Okay? And it's this. Okay? This is the standard way to write down the description of your programming language. And right, it's basically been around since just before the invention of the computer. So gamma is just a bunch of free variables. So gamma might be x is an integer and um, y is a character, okay? And m might be take the integer and add one to it. Well, that'll give us another integer. And um, n might be take the character 
and tell us if it's um, a letter or not, and that'll give us a Boolean. Okay, so gamma has two variables, x and y. x is an integer, y is a character. m looks at x and adds one to it and gives us another integer. n looks at the character, tells us if it's a letter, and gives us a Boolean. And then we can build an mn pair, right? Which would be an integer Boolean pair. So pairing straightforward. And then if L is an AB pair, first of L would of course be an A, and second of L would be a B. So category theory gives us exactly what we need for doing the semantics of that. So、um, gamma represents our environment. It's just The type that binds, that gives you a value for each free variable, and then f converts that into a value of type A, and g converts that into a value of type B, and then your f-g pair builds you an AB pair. And then if h is some term that takes your environment into an AB pair, h followed by first gives you an A, and h followed by second gives you a B. Okay, so we can convert. Good old、um, type system into、uh, good old、uh, semantics using category theory.、Uh, and how does all this relate to logic? So、um, times we've been using to build a record. What does times correspond to in logic? One of your three main constructors. And correct. So, times is just conjunction. So, what does this tell us? If you, if m is a proof of a and n is a proof of b, and m n pair is a proof that a and b both hold. And if I know a and b, then by extracting the first component of the proof l, I get a proof of a. And if I know a and b, then by extracting the second component, I get a proof of b. This, by the way, is the second grievous error that I made in doing these slides, which is m and n and all these terms here and all the arrows. I should have colored them in red, so I could have just said, "Just look at the blue bits," and that gives you the logic. That's what I normally do. So that's the second grievous error in the talk. Okay, that's it. That's products. Any questions about products? Anybody want to say this is all really simple? Why are you bothering to show us this? You've just taken something really easy and made it hard. Anybody feeling that? Raise your hand if that's what you're feeling.、Uh, just a couple of people are feeling that. Okay. Why would we want to make it hard? I will show you why. Okay. Here's the other major data structure: the sum. So a sum、um, is sometimes called a, a disjoint union, or record variance. I think are what they're called in、um, Pascal. What's, what's your favorite name for this kind of data structure? Unit, union. Okay, it's a disjoint union. Yeah. Anybody else have a favorite name for this data structure? Either, either. Yes. In Haskell, it's called either. In Ruby, it's called this is too hard for us. <laughs> And most object-oriented languages, you, you have to go to a lot of trouble to build this in an object-oriented language using inheritance or whatever, but you can. Right, so an object-oriented language would sort of be like, well,、um, what a and b inherits from a and inherits from b, or something like that. I can't even remember which way around the inheritance goes. You can probably do it either way.、Um, okay, but this is disjoint union, right? And so, given an a, we can inject it into the type a plus b. So, right in your computer, how would you actually represent this? So, a might be an integer, and then an a plus b would be something with a tag field. Followed by a value, so this injection sets the tag to be zero, say, and then copies in the integer. And this direction, if b is a character, say, sets the tag to be one and then copies in the character. And then your second field needs to be big enough to contain either an integer or a character. People are used to that kind of data structure. I、right, use structs for that in C, for instance.、Um, And now, so in left and in right, build one of these things. How do we take it apart? We do a case analysis, right? So if we've got if f is a function from an a to a c, and g is a function from a b to a c, how do we get a c from one of these 
some ants. Well, you look at it, and if it's an A, you apply F to it. But if it's a B, then you apply G to it. And then, what do the rules tell us? Well, if you have in left followed by F and G, that gives you an F. And if you have in right followed by F and G, that gives you a G. And、um, again, it's dotted. It's universal. So,、uh, if you have some H that makes this diagram commute, you know that that's the same as F and G. What am I going to do next? Identity, right? So, right. We pick the simple case. Pick F to be in left. Pick G to be in right. Pick C to be A plus B. And then we know that identity makes these things commute. So, in left paired with in right must be the same as the identity. So, what does this one say? This says, okay, look at the sum. Look at the sum and if it's.、Uh, If the tag is zero, then it's an A, and use the A to build an A plus B pair with tag zero.、And、if the tag is one, it's a B, so use in right to build an A or B pair with tag one. And oh, that doesn't do very much, does it? Okay. Now notice, by the way, that what we've done here. Right. What is this worth like saying? It says, what is an arrow? From C to A times B, it says any arrow from C to A times B can be built up by a pair of arrows, one from C to A and one from C to B. Right? And F G builds that, and then given such an arrow from C to A times B, I can get back the arrows to A and to B by composing with first and second. So there's an isomorphism. Having a pair of arrows, one from C to A and one from C to B, is the same. As having an arrow from C to A times B, and so we say we have an isomorphism. So this curly C followed by C and、e、A just means I actually define that here, right? Curly C of A and B is just the set of all arrows from A to B in category curly C. Okay, so we're just using a little bit more advanced notation. And this is the cool thing about category theory: is everything that I did in this diagram at length is just summarized in this one equation. And similarly, what does it mean to have a sum? It means、um, that having an arrow from an A plus a B to a C is the same as having an arrow from an A to a C and having an arrow from a B to a C. So F G, the case analysis, builds that up. And、um, to take this apart, you can just pre-compose your arrow from A plus B to C with either in left. That'll give you an arrow. From A into A plus B to C, or precompose it within right, which gives you an arrow from B to A plus B into C. So arrows from A to C and B to C. So again, we've got an isomorphism. Okay. And then we can turn it into a programming language. If M is a term of type A, then in left of M is a term of type A plus B. And for the semantics, we just build our term of type A, and then apply in left. To the result, to get a term of type A plus B.、So、that's how you construct a sum and, and in right similarly. Ooh, and then the fun one is case analysis, which looks a bit different, doesn't it?、Right? How do we do case analysis in our programming language with a case expression? So L is an A plus B term, and X is a. We extend the environment with a variable X of type A, or we extend the environment with a variable Y of type B. Okay, and then P and Q are terms in those extended environments that give us a C. So how does case analysis work? Do case L of, and then if it's if the tag is zero, we bind X to the value of A. So X will be a value of type A, and then we can evaluate P. And、um, if the tag is one, we bind Y to the value of type、uh, B, and then evaluate Q. Okay, so it's just this little case analysis. How many people have seen case expressions like that before? Okay, so not many of you. So this this is a very useful construct, right? This is how you pull apart two alternatives. 
So this is a standard contract in Haskell and F Sharp and pretty much every functional language you can name. And it's called pattern matching, that's right. So the patterns here would be in left X or in right Y. And then to get this as semantics, how do we do that? Well, um, let's pair, so gamma is our environment, let's do a pair of that with H, and that'll give us an A plus or B. So now we've got the environment gamma and the A or B, and then we can convert that to a gamma paired with an A or a gamma paired with a B. Right? How do you do that? Well, look at your A or B. If its tag is zero, pair gamma with A. If its tag is one, pair gamma with B. And then put back your tag. So, and then we've got things that we can apply FG to, and that gives us a C. So notice we need this additional construct, which is called distributivity. Here it is, right? It just says, given an A plus C pair, uh, paired with, sorry, an a, a choice of an A or a C, and a choice of a B or a C, we can get an a, a choice of an A or a B and a C. And this is the function that goes one way, and this is the function that goes another way. Oh, and it uses this funny thing called cur. What's that? Well, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, and it's actually going this way around is the one that we needed. Okay, so that gives us the semantics. And again, this is logic. What connective of logic do you think plus is? or disjunction, right? So it says, well, if I've got a proof of A, I've also got a proof of A or B. And the proof is, A or B is true because A is true. And similarly with B. And then, oh, if I've got a proof of A or B, and if I assume A, right, you told us never to assume anything, but we're going to assume stuff. If I assume A, then I can prove C. And if I assume B, then I can prove C. So if knowing A, I can prove C, and knowing B, I can prove C, and all I know is A or B, ah, I can still prove C, right? Because either A is true, in which case C is true, or B is true, in which case C is true. So either way, C is true. Okay, and then this is the categorical way of assigning a meaning to that logic. Okay, so I mentioned this thing called curry, and that requires this thing called exponentials. Yep, I was right, it would take more than half an hour. Um, and this is a little bit trickier. So you, I, we have to assume we already know about pairs, products. We don't actually need sums to define this. But let gamma, I should have used C here, but I've called it gamma. So I've got gamma paired with an A, and F takes that to a B. This is like an environment that defines everything in gamma and also defines A. And what this says, curry F, right? Here's our, another isomorphism for us. It says an arrow from gamma times A to B is the same as an arrow from gamma to this A arrow B thing. So A arrow B is a function space. This is the type of functions from A to B. Wait, I thought arrows were functions. Now you're saying objects are functions. Ooh. Okay. So if you have a language where data is one kind of thing and functions are another kind of thing, that's called first order. And category theory can model that. But if you have functions as first class citizens, is sometimes how it's put, so that your data can itself be a function, so that you can have functions that act on functions, or functions that return functions, or pairs of functions, or disjoint unions of functions, or whatever you want, then those are called higher order functions. And that's modeled by saying, oh, okay, functions aren't just something in the category, but every arrow in the category also corresponds to an object in the category. And that's what we're doing here. So, if that doesn't make your head hurt, it should. Right? That is the most profound idea in computing. The idea that programs are also data. Not every data is a program, but every program can be converted into data. And in category theory, you capture that idea with what's called a Cartesian closed category, which is a, a fancy name for just saying, we're going to be able to treat functions as data. So curry of F 
takes a gamma and gives us an A to B function. So remember, F takes a gamma and an A and gives us a B. And this takes just a gamma and gives us an A to B. So it stores away gamma and stores away the function f, and then says, wait, and then as soon as you've given me an a, I'll pair that with gamma and use f to get a b. So it's just delaying for a bit. So in programming terms, this is called a closure. So what happens? What's the meaning of this? So curry f is our way of building a function. And if I've built a function f, what does that mean? Well, if I take the gamma and I take a value of type a, Don't change the value of type A. So cross ID just means leave this part of the pair the same. Uh, and you, you can actually build this using the angle bracket construction, right? This just says um, start with a gamma A pair uh, and apply first and curry F to get the first component of the pair and apply second and ID to get the second component of the pair. So we've applied curry F to the first bit and left the second bit unchanged. And then apply takes the function and applies it to the value to give the result of type B. This just says, take a function, apply it to the value, give a result of type B. And again, we can turn this into our programming language. So if in environment gamma, we also have a variable x of type A, and n is a term of type B, then lambda x, yes, there's lambda, lambda x dot n is a function from A to B. So x might be a number, and gamma might have some other number in it, say y is a number, and then n would be x plus y. So this is the add y to things function, which goes from integers to integers and has y in gamma somewhere, which is stored in the closure. Uh, and then the other one is even easier, right? Given l is a function from a to b, and m is a term of type a, l applied to m gives you a b. And then it turns out that the first one, you give it a semantics with curry, and the second one, you just pair up the two things and then use apply. So the semantics is very straightforward. And again, this corresponds to logic. And what thing is arrow in logic? Implication. You've just learned the three most important constructs in programming languages. The record, the variant record, and the function. So let me just finish by showing you two cool things. This is it, right? This is what I was building up to. Okay, prepare to have your socks knocked off. Whee! Look, what's the relationship between products and sums? It's the same diagram, you just reverse all the arrows. These are exactly the same thing. We just turned all the arrows around. So it's not like products and sums are a little bit similar. No, they are what's called dual. They are exactly dual. Right? In logic, when you learn um, and and or are dual to each other by De Morgan's laws, this is explaining that. Okay? So this is why category theory is worth learning. Because, you know, you, you'd never see this in the programming language, right? This, with this case thing, does not look dual to that. Does it? They look rather different. But no, they are exactly dual. And that's what category theory buys you. I, I, just, I just think this is so cool. And I hope you do too. Right? And then the last thing is, right, we had all these things with isomorphisms, right? How do you define product? Well, it says this pair of arrows is the same as this arrow. Same for sum. And then for um, functions, it says, well, C paired with an A, a function from that to B, is the same as a function from C to an A to B function. You already learned these, right? You learned these back in high school. Because all we do is we write an arrow from C to A. How many of these are there? Let's say C and A are finite sets. So if C is a set of size C and A is a set of size A, how many functions are there from C to A? Well, if A is 3, there'd be C cubed, right? One for if, um, sorry, A, if C is size 3, there'd be A cubed functions, right? One for um, the first value of C, one for the second value, and one for the third value. 
So if A is 2 and C is 3, there are eight different functions. Um, and we can see that by just writing A to the C for the set of all functions from C to A, and B to the C for the set of all functions from C to B, and then A times B to the C for the set of all functions from C to an AB pair. So this isomorphism gets rewritten like this. You knew that already, didn't you? And the other isomorphism gets written like this, and you knew that already as well. And uh, the third isomorphism gets written like this, and you knew that too, right? b to the c times a, same as just raise b to the eighth power and then raise it to the cth power. So notice that here we've written exponents and products for exponents and products both in the category level and at the object level. Those careful distinctions that we made between arrows and objects that represent arrows have all gone away. But other than mushing everything together, you already knew all this in high school. Right? So it's easy stuff made hard, made even easier. That's category theory. Okay, so I need to finish now. Right? I'm just going to leave you with one thought. Right? All of this was a build-up to explain the semantics of lambda calculus and to explain deep connections between programming languages based on lambda calculus and logical ideas for natural deduction and what you learned in high school. Right? What do you take away from all this? Lambda calculus should be the basis of what you do. You should use some, function, some programming language which is based on lambda calculus. And no matter what the people with Java and C++ tell you, yeah, they've added in lambdas as Johnny come lately, but this means, no, use Haskell, use F Sharp, use standard ML, use one of the language, use Lisp, use Scheme, use one of the languages that has this at its core. What's the lesson when you have a tough job, what you should think is that this is a job, for Lambda Calculus! <laughs>